Hey, this episode is brought to you in part by Zipix Nicotine Toothpicks. Zipix brings you a totally satisfying, convenient, and great tasting way to curb your nicotine cravings. Uh, it is uh, the year 2024. It is time for you to stop putting smoke and vape in your lungs, folks. And now you can get your nicotine fix anytime, anywhere, without having to rely on smelly cigarettes or God knows what's in that uh, vape stuff. Zipix Toothpicks gives you an easier, a healthier, and a more discreet way to get your nicotine uh, fix. They're available in six flavors. They have options in two milligrams and three milligrams of nicotine. So if you want to ingest less nicotine, you start with three, then you go with two, and then... You can have uh, what Zipix also offers, which is a caffeine and B12-infused toothpicks. And if you're not a nicotine user and you just like uh, toothpicks like I do, uh, you'll enjoy those as well. Zipix are great to use it for airline flights, uh, if you go into a sports game or something like that, or a restaurant, literally everywhere else that smoking and vaping are banned. They're also one of the most cost-effective nicotine products on the market. So if you're using, I don't know, patches or gum or something like that, uh, Zipix have already helped tens of thousands of customers in leading a healthier lifestyle. And if you currently smoke or vape, they can probably help you too. For me, toothpicks were very, very key uh, in uh, dealing with my oral uh, uh, cravings uh, back in the day. I am a former smoker myself. Uh, make your lungs happy. Try Zipix nicotine toothpicks. Ditch the cigarettes. Ditch the vape. Get some nicotine infused toothpicks at zipixtoothpicks.com today. Get 10% off your first order by using the code MAJORITY10. That's the word majority and the number 10 at checkout. Your lungs are going to be glad you did. And if you smoke, everybody around you who smells you is going to be glad you, do. you, you did. You got to be 21 years or older to order. Warning, nicotine is an addictive chemical, believe me. Zip more, smoke less with Zipix nicotine toothpicks. Okay, and now it's time for the show. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> if I get the feeling you've been cheated... It is Wednesday, February 28th. 2024 my name is sam cedar this is the five-time award-winning majority report we are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged gowanus canal in the heartland of america downtown brooklyn usa on the program today michelle eisen organizing uh member of starbucks workers united on this Really earth shattering. Well, maybe that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but not necessarily if this actually comes to, to bear. Monumentous, let's put it that way Starbucks Union win. Then we'll be talking to uh, Melissa Jira Grant, staff writer at the New Republic, on the Republican theocratic agenda for 2025. Meanwhile, in Michigan, uncommitted takes almost 15% of the vote in that uh, primary as both Biden and Trump pick up the delegates. Two days until the government uh, shutdown, or at least a partial one, still no deal as Mike Johnson holding desperately onto his gavel. U.S. wants written assurances that Israel will abide by international law while using U.S. weapons 
and it wants those assurances right this minute. I mean, I'm sorry, in about three or four weeks. IVF protections to be introduced in, uh, or I should say IVF protection law to be introduced in the Senate today. Republicans vow to block it. Um, in an encouraging sign for the UAW, more than half of the Tuscaloosa Mercedes plant workers sign union cards. Arizona Republicans pushing for a free pass to murder immigrants if they trespass on private property. U.S. opens an antitrust probe of United Health, the biggest uh, health insurance company in the country. New York State's Democrats draw weak maps, refuse to press advantage to fight national Republican gerrymandering. And new study, temperatures in the North Atlantic Ocean are outstripping the models. And in Nepo baby news, Hunter Biden testifies uh, in the impeachment inquiry and Laura Trump declares her RNC candidacy. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us. Emma is off today, so I will say this. It is a uh, hump day. And... Um, Halfway through the week, uh, that much closer to uh, a potential government shutdown. The, I, if I had to predict right now, they're going to come up with another kick the can down the road, uh, continuing resolution. It, it, it's this weird sort of form of uh, of delusion. Like, I, I don't know if like, a, I, I wonder, like at one point, Mike Johnson's just got to be like, I hope a couple of the members of the house pass away Republican ones. And then I won't have the, I won't be the leadership. I'll be, uh, the house minority leader. And then I won't have to worry about any of this. I honestly think that's gotta be what his strategy is because it's been, how long has this deal been in place? Like this continuing resolution was done two or three months ago. And I don't, I don't know what he thought was going to change. Um, but we shall see, uh, they're working on him. Like uh, Mitch McConnell's trying to lean on him. I mean, I think literally, uh, so that he can uh, stay upright, but, uh, it remains to be seen what will happen. We will know more in the coming days. Meanwhile, let's turn to, uh, Michigan. Um, let's just start with how, uh, well, <sighs> I've seen people complain about the New York Times reporting it this way, and it, it makes some sense to complain about this. Look at um, look at how, uh, how uh, the the New York Times. This is um, number three. Um, the New York Times um, showed this. Now we should say that um, Joe Biden, President Biden, won the state's Democratic primary election, but faced opposition over his Gaza policy. And Donald Trump easily beat Nikki Haley. Now, the irony is, is that uh, uh, Joe Biden got, had about 80% of the vote, maybe 78%, and Trump had like 65%. Um, but the reality is, is that many, Donald Trump what, had 45% of the vote in the uh, 2016 primary, and ultimately the other 55% came home. They'll come home. Republicans, they just fall in line. Um, Unless Haley starts messaging quite differently and runs a completely different... I, I don't think she's saying... Like, yeah, like you said, they're going to fall in line. They're going to fall in line. I mean, it's conceivable. There are some people who are going out and voting for Haley. Maybe uh, they registered as Republicans or they can go in and open primaries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that all, never had an intention to vote for a Republican in the general election anyways. Um, but they're going to fall in line. If you had told anybody in the total uh, vote tally for Democrats 
in uh, Michigan was about 750,000. I'm just uh, ballparking this. It's about half of what it was in 2020 in the primary. Now, because this primary, for all intents and purposes, was not contested. I mean, Dean Phillips was really the only candidate in the race besides Joe Biden. Uh, Marianne Williamson was on the ballot, but she dropped out in February. Dean Phillips was the only active candidate, and he came in fourth. <laughs> it was Joe Biden, uncommitted, Marianne Williamson, and then Dean Phillips. But if you had told, and, you know, uh, I'm looking at a piece by uh, Mike Tomaski in uh, The New Republic uh, from like two days ago. He anticipated the voting uh, that the uh, the turnout could be closer to like 1.1 million, 1.2 million based upon early voting, the, which suggests that the early voting there were more Republicans who voted early voting than one would expect based upon um, uh, recent history. Nevertheless, he was saying in that article, if if uncommitted was to reach 100,000, like close to 10%, even 9%, that would be a big deal. And in fact, uncommitted broke 100,000 with only 750,000 votes. Three or four percentage more than what anybody would have said two days ago would be a big deal. We were talking in the office like 100,000. That, that seems unlikely. They said they like called about 100,000 people. So you at least got most of those people and picked up some. Uh, I, I mean, and this was a campaign that, you know, started in earnest, I don't know, three or four or five weeks ago. And I can't imagine there was a lot of money behind it. And you're going to hear it was because he was, uh, because Biden's older, et cetera, et cetera, because they don't want it to be about a specific thing that can be addressed. Here is uh, how some of this was, this is pretty impressive. Well, I don't mean it in a good way. This is CNN. Uh, they're talking about the uh, primary results. This took place, I don't know, like at around, uh, as the polling was starting to come in, you can see that there is only like... 15 Pacific time. Yeah, and so 9.15 uh, Eastern time. And you can see that there's only, I don't know, like uh, a small percentage in at this point. Uh, maybe like 10% had been counted, if that. Or maybe a little bit more maybe 15%, uh, but uncommitted was at 16% at this point. It ended up finishing, I think, closer to 14%. But people, 16% uh, was like, what? And uh, here is how CNN was dealing with this. I don't think for many voters who are voting uncommitted that they're going to vote uncommitted and then say, Donald Trump is my choice. I think this is, a, I think this is more complicated than that. Yeah, I do agree with you, Bakari. I mean, no one that I interface with said that they wanted to vote for Donald J. Trump. How There is a however here. And I think sometimes as we talk about this issue, we're making it, we're centering President Biden. We are centering former President Donald J. Trump when the uncommitted effort is to center the people closest to the pain. And that is the Arab American community. That is the Palestinian community. That is communities that care about peace. And so while this president was in the ice cream shop saying, I think there's going to be a ceasefire, 30,000 people have been slaughtered. People are living in famine. They can't get medical care, so it can't come soon enough for them. And that was really the weight that I picked up on when I was in Dearborn. So we get to be comfortable and talk about this like these people are widgets when they are, in fact, suffering. And I am young enough to remember, colleagues, when Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and also Congresswoman Cori Bush called for a ceasefire very early on, they were called abhorrent. Now, fast forward to all of these bodies laying in the wake and people who are living through this every single day. So, I, I there, by the way, there's also been slaughter in, in Israel. I was going to well. say, I, so, yeah. so there, there's, yeah, no, there's I, a lot of pain on both sides. But no, so I'm not. Really I'm not a lecture on the problem. No, but I'm, I'm talking about yeah. the, the politics of this tonight. How what to you would be a victory as somebody was calling yeah. for this uncommitted vote? What to you would be a victory tonight? 
on, to get that message across. I'm not denying that pain. All I'm saying that at a certain point after October the 7th, it becomes clear. I mean, you have a right wing prime minister. Right. We don't need to debate the issue. But, but you understand, I'm not denying anybody's pain. What I am saying is that this president and our country has the power to say to Netanyahu, we need a permanent ceasefire. The only time Within hostages. Reason, though, if I can only, push back, wait, one more point. The only time hostages were released is when we had that brief ceasefire. That is another reason I, why I, mean, I, 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 I don't, but I, I also I also have to remind people we had a ceasefire prior to October 7th, yeah. right? I mean, that that's a point. And I, I, I get centering people and I, I completely understand that. But I think Anderson, your point is valid as well, that there is a lot of pain to go around and we cannot forget that. But I'm talking about a tangible solutions. That's what I, that's what I'm, and as we look at the, because we can we we can debate and talk about this on a on a on a level of humanity which we cannot forget. But we also have to look at the results from tonight. And what I'm saying is that there are tangible results this White House can deliver. And I think if they're able to deliver, now if they miss, and then then you have a totally different scenario. Okay, reality, this is amazing how they're just talking around this, yeah. because the there the politics of this are fairly actually straightforward, but they must go through. Um, like why they are voting uncommitted. And to say that there are, you know, uh, b both sides, let me look at like the, the story of October 7th is just not as durable as the story of what has been happening for the past three or four months. And there, increasingly, this makes, I mean, I don't care that uh, Anderson Cooper is out of touch, but this makes the administration out of touch. And how do we know the administration realizes this? Is because the day after uh, these results yesterday, the U.S. is sending a letter and, and is demanding from Israel. Remember, they did this memorandum a couple of weeks ago, which is already existing law, which is that the uh, those countries receiving U.S. military equipment must establish that they're not or must not use these in a way that violates international law. Now, Israel has been clearly doing that. The memorandum came out a couple of weeks ago. The reason why the Biden administration uh, announces today that they're demanding that Israel account and, and show that they're not using the weapons in a way that uh, um, breaks international law, the reason why that letter comes out today or that request comes out today or that demand comes out today is because of this. They're, they're in response to that, that, those numbers. Now, it's not going to be sufficient because the reason why they kick it out until mid-March, when, uh, wh when does Ramadan start? It's because they're going to allow the Israelis with no accountability to attack Rafah. Starts in the evening of March 10th. They're basically said, you've got a safe harbor now. You've got 10 days to do what you need to do. I mean, this is, if you're going to do the political analysis of this, the question is, will these people who voted uncommitted, not whether they're going to vote for Donald Trump, if you voted for uncommitted in the Democratic Party, you are doing so because you're saying, I don't want to vote for Donald Trump. I don't like Donald Trump. I want the explicit message. The explicit message is I don't want to vote for Donald Trump because otherwise I'll just stay home. And maybe some people did do that. We don't know. But you vote for uncommitted because you're saying I want to vote for you. But you need to be responsive to our complaints. And then when Dina Turner says this is what our complaints are the complaints are they don't want to hear about it they just want to talk about the politics of it it's not just like this not just math there is a reason why people are voting this way and there are concrete steps that the biden administration could take to mitigate and to address some of those complaints some they won't be able to address because it's too late but doing this like sort of like uh the lip service is not going to work because we're going to see this in colorado where, where's the next one that uh, we were talking to? It was Minnesota. Well. In Minnesota. Because what's going to happen with this over 100,000 vote from uncommitted is it's going to inspire other, uh, 
other other movements like this in these states. And what is worse for Biden and Biden's prospects is if he doesn't react, it's going to be doubly worse. Because now he's been put on notice by people. People made the effort to, to uh, communicate to the Biden administration this way. And you're going to disempower these people more if you don't respond. This is, of course, like putting aside all of the sort of like basic humanity associated with this. And all the polling. This is not a controversial position in terms of all the people that uh, Biden wants to vote for him in, in, in November. Yeah, it may just, be a controversial position with, I don't know, what is that, Haim Sabin, or whatever that guy's name yeah. is. I, I'm not joking. Right, yeah. That he was fundraising with out in California yeah. a few yeah. weeks ago. Um, but this is, this is, this is the, uh, the, you know. And not just Muslim communities. No, this is 28% of under uh, age uh, 35 were in the, in the polling. And this is just going to increase. This number is not going to go down. It's going to increase. They just don't get that. Is there anything? I don't think we need to see any more of that. All right. Uh, in a moment, we're going to be talking to Michelle Eisen, organizing member of the Starbucks Workers United. This is a big deal what's happened with Starbucks. Big, big deal. Because with all the union activity that we've seen, union density has not grown in the private sector. And part of it is because in these union movements that we've seen, these corporations have like put up a roadblock to uh, actually getting into a contract. And that's about to change with Starbucks. And uh, we, we will talk to um, uh, Michelle uh, as the reasons why. You may remember she came onto the program, I think it was about a year ago in March of, of last year. Was it March? And uh, from Buffalo. The first Starbucks uh, to organize. Now there's 400 uh, Starbucks that have organized. And and I suspect if this happens, you're going to see a lot more. But we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, got a word from our sponsor. And then we'll be talking to Ms., uh, Melissa uh, uh, Gira Grant about uh, the Project 2025 that the Heritage Foundation and all the Republicans have gotten ready. And we're going to be talking about this a lot, but we're going to specifically focus on the sort of theocratic nature of, of, of the uh, plans. Uh, but first, word from our sponsor today. This is one of those sponsors where I was using it before they became a sponsor. And so uh, I always get excited about this. Um, fastgrowingtrees.com is the biggest online nursery in the United States with more than 10,000 different kinds of plants and over 2 million happy customers in the U.S., I am one of those customers. You can grow lemon, avocado, olive, or fig trees inside your home on top of the wide variety of houseplants available. Also, they have um, uh, Zone 5 hardy uh, fig trees. And I now know how to grow them properly, too. Got to really cut them down dramatically in the winter. Put hay on them. Yep. Uh, and then they just go crazy in the summer. Uh, fast growing trees makes it easy to order online and your plants are shipped directly to your door in one to two days. Folks, we are like in zone five. We're a month and a half month away from planting. Maybe not even. They also have a 30 day alive and thrive guarantee. They offer free plant consultation forever. The experts of fast growing trees curate thousands of plants. So you can find the perfect fit for your specific climate location and needs. You don't have to drive around to nurseries. You don't have to go to a big box store where they have like uh, three uh, types of apple trees. And they're all like, you know, those uh, delicious apples, which I don't even, they, uh, they should be, those trees should be illegal. Fast growing uh, trees, you get all sorts of varieties of apples, of uh, Asian pears, of plums, of peaches. doesn't matter if you're looking to add privacy or shade or natural beauty to your yard. Fast Growing Trees has in-house experts ready to help you right, make the right selection. You can talk to a plant expert about your soil type, your landscape design, how to take care of your plants, everything else you need. No green thumb required. I have grown Asian pear trees. Well, here's the thing about Fast Growing Trees that is great. They're I don't think their trees actually grow faster, but they ship bigger trees. 
And so uh, you can get fruit in year. You plant it and you can get fruit the following year. Arkansas black apples, um, Hosea Asian pears. Um, I've had success with all of those. Right now, they have some of the best deals online, like up to half on select plants and other deals. And listeners to our show get an additional 15% off when using the code MAJORITY at checkout. That's an additional 15% off at FastGrowingTrees.com using the code MAJORITY at checkout. FastGrowingTrees.com, code MAJORITY, offers valid for a limited time. Terms and conditions may apply. Also, uh, when you think about uh, great duos in the uh, history of the world, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, all of mine are comedic. Um, think about the perfect duo when it comes to growing your business. That is you and it is Shopify. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your sh online shop stage to the first real life store stage, all the way to the, we, did we just hit a million sales stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. doesn't matter whether you're selling scented soap or outdoor uh, outfits or uh, merch from the majority report store. Shopify helps you sell everywhere. They have an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It integrates with their in-person point of sale system. And it goes through all the uh, major um, social media sites. Doesn't matter. Wherever, whatever you're selling, Shopify has got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers. Has the internet's best converting checkout. 36% better on average compared to other leading commerce platforms. And you can sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify magic. It is your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the U.S., Shopify's global force behind all birds and Rothy's and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's award-winning help is there to support your success in every step of the way. Because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Uh, honestly, the easiest, scale us, um, like sort of, um, what do you call it, turnkey type of system possible. I was so intimidated about starting up a, um, a merch store took us years to do it was really just an emotional thing because i was like there's no way this is going to be a hassle but that's what we, we got the uh um turn the uh, uh uh the get the void out we did that shirt and we were able to get it up on our site you know immediately it's easy and the thing is shopify grows with you so if your business gets huge uh it works um just as well if not better Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash majority. All lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash majority right now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash majority. We'll put links to all of that in the, um, uh, in the podcast and YouTube descriptions as well as at majority.fm. Uh, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we'll be talking to Michelle Eisen. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Emma Vigland off today. Uh, joining us again, Michelle Eisen, organizing a member of the Starbucks Workers United from the Buffalo store. Uh, and uh, Michelle, last time we spoke was about I don't know, almost a year ago. Um, maybe, yeah, about 11 months. Um, you guys had successfully sort of like um, uh, unionized. And is, since then was dealing with sort of the stonewalling by Starbucks in terms of getting a contract. And in the past 24 hours, you've had some really great news. Yeah. Um, Starbucks has just decided to, to stop fighting and to work with the union. And um, 
it seems that they want to expedite getting a, a contract with the unionized locations as quickly as possible. Um, and they've made a lot of other commitments uh, in order to prove to us that they're they're serious about this. So it's it's been great. It's a completely different world than it was when I talked to you a year ago. All right. So tell us what's happened since that world. And then we can talk about like, uh, because th this agreement, um, at least in principle, and, and there's some details and you guys have issued a joint statement actually came out of like, sort of like a, a side litigation. Uh, but, but let, before we get to that, w walk us through what's happened over the past year. I think we spoke, it was just prior to the Senate hearing. Is that correct? I think um, it was, yeah, before uh, I was Howard trying to Schultz remember. got up there and got dressed down. Yeah. I mean, he was still going around yeah. saying, like, this is like the like uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, and we're going to share a blanket with each other, except for you're not going to yeah. get health care. Yeah. Yeah, he was, he was telling that story for a while. Um, since then, you know, things didn't really change until very, very recently. The same things we discussed about a year ago, the, the treatment of the unionized workers by Starbucks, the withholding of benefits, you know, the refusing to come to the bargaining table in any sort of meaningful way to try to get contracts in this now almost, you know, we're just sitting at, I think, 399 unionized locations, we should hit 400 next week or something like that. Um, and it continued like that from the last conversation we had all the way through to, you know, a, a few days ago. Um, there was a statement that the company had issued back in December. It was actually the day before Elmwood's two year anniversary of unionizing that made it sound like they wanted to move forward. Uh, but then we didn't see that in any of their actions. You know, they, they released the statement. It went to the media before it, it even went to the union, which is kind of a red flag. And um, then we didn't really see anything change. And then, you know, just in the last few days, all of a sudden um, they're doing what I always hoped the company would do, you know, what this very naive barista who started in 2010 because this was a better company to work for always kind of said, I've seen them make, make mistakes. In 14 years, I've seen mistakes be made, but I've also seen them do what they needed to do to right those mistakes. And I was waiting for that moment in this situation and it, it has finally arrived. So give me a sense of like, um, and, and you know, um, there were, they were taken to the National Labor Relations Board. There were complaints put in there about how they had fired uh, workers, how they were um, harassing workers. But the, the, the benefits, like, okay, you had, let's just say for the sake of art, 399 stores that uh, had been um, uh, unionized uh, out of uh, several thousand uh, Starbucks around the country. Like what, how did they sort of punish those union shops versus the, what kind of treatment they were providing for the non-union shops? So one of the tactics they took very early on in the campaign, I think it was May of 2022, um, was to grant a suite of new benefits that included uh, wage increases, included a, a whole bunch of other things, different health benefits, different accruals of things like sick time and um, you know vacation time, stuff like that. Um, credit card tipping, which was huge. That was one of the first asks that the union actually made when we won was to say we wanted credit card tipping instituted in our stores. Starbucks had never allowed credit card tipping. You know, that's a, believe it or not. So when that's you, a, when that's you got your, your coffee, you use a credit card, there's no like, how much do you want no. to tip thing? Right. Okay. No, you could tip with, for a very long time, it was just cash. Then the Starbucks app came out and you could tip through the app. But credit card tipping until the union didn't exist within the company. And how many people, I mean, I never have cash on me. You know, right. everyone is using right. their credit card. Um, and so they granted those benefits, but they said, if you're a union shop, you don't get them. And if you're a store attempting to organize, you also don't get them. Um, and so there's different like tiers of stores that fall into different categories. So some stores waited till those benefits were granted and then organized anyway, very smart strategy. So there are some union stores that do have these benefits because they were you know, strategic, but there are stores like mine, who was the first one who has nothing. You know, we there's two stores here in Buffalo who organized the first. And as far as the tiers go, we've gotten absolutely nothing. Um, and so this is this is significant because on top of granting these benefits, finally, as a show of good faith, a show that they're serious, that they do want to proceed, you know, in a meaningful way. Um, that also means calculating the back pay that would have come from what those tips would have been and 
calculating the back pay that would have come from the raises that we also didn't receive. Um, so, you know, workers are finally going to be, as the NLRB would call it, be made whole for for all of the the last two and a half years. That's um, I, I mean, it's that that's a big deal. And, and let, let's just back up a little bit. This came out of these this round of negotiations started, and we should say Howard Schultz is gone now. He is, he is no longer the CEO. He and he hasn't been for about a year. He's also no longer on the board of directors, is my understanding. He's still, I think, a major so uh, a shareholder, but he's no longer on the board of directors. So he's he's stepped away. And I've read a lot of stuff about like the the idea of like you know sometimes founders of the company um, they they don't look at these things in the same way that like, you know, uh, people come in who are, you know, realize like, this is a business. These are not my, these are not my children who work, work here. I'm not, I can't treat them. I got to treat them like adults. Um, and it sort of has that feel, but this started with a lawsuit that Starbucks had filed against the union for calling themselves the Starbucks union, essentially. Yes, essentially. It was a trademark lawsuit. That was filed la late last fall. Um, they they filed a lawsuit against us. I think we counter sued, you know, the, the way you do things, the way the legal world works. And um, it had, both parties had agreed to settle this issue in mediation. So it wasn't going to go as far as being decided by, you know, a judge. Um, and that's what my understanding is this was all that was happening in that day or all that was supposed to happen as far as we knew was just a mediation session to try to settle this trademark issue. Um, and then that session finished um, and, you know, a, a conversation was had between their legal counsel and our legal counsel that kind of paved the way to, to talk about this agreement. Um, and it was, the, the word agreement is kind of strange to me because technically speaking, this isn't an agreement. It's, right. you know, there's no contract yet. The workers haven't been at the table to be able to, to negotiate this contract, which is what is going to happen. What, what, what they were able to reach was some sort of peace where they could say, all right, both sides are ready to move forward. What, and the company said, you know, what do we need to do to show you that, that we, we are serious? We want to proceed in good faith. And that was us saying, we, we need you to give us the benefits that you withheld from these workers. If you can do that and you can do that quickly or immediately, then we're going to know that you're serious and we're going to, we, we are ready to turn over a new leaf. Let's go. And they said, yes, well, we will do that. Um, and so they gave other things as well, which is amazing. What were the other things? Um, you know, the agreement to settle all current litigation, like no, so any, and there are, I can't even tell you probably dozens of ULP hearings that are either happening Unfair or, or labor scheduled practice. to happen. Yes. Unfair yeah. labor practice uh, to, hearings with administrative judges with the uh, with the uh, um, uh, labor department essentially. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So to settle all of that litigation, including the trademark issue, so that's going to be settled. Um, and the biggest thing for us was essentially, you know, they said we want a path forward to allow our workers the choice to organize without any level of interference, and we are vowing that we won't interfere in that process. We will not let our managers, our store managers or district managers interfere in that process. Going forward, if a Starbucks worker or workers at a particular store want to join the union, we are gonna let that go go through without any level of um, what we've just seen in the last two and a half years, uh, which is, is amazing. And with no limitations to that is my understanding. So like you said, we're at 400 stores. There are just under 9,000 in the US, I believe. Um, it seems to me like what the company is saying is the path forward for our company is to have a unionized workforce and we are going to embrace that instead of fight it. And what that means for Starbucks and Starbucks workers is unbelievable. What that also means in terms of just the food service sector or any worker for a, a multi-global, multi-billion you know, billion dollar corporation you know, it just seems like this This is lasting. This is something very, very important. This is, I think, like that last point, I think we can't sort of uh, uh, emphasize enough because once the company basically makes the assessment that it's going to, it's it's just easier for us to not fight this. 
uh, it is more than likely, it is also then becomes immediately easier for them to have an all unionized force at that point. Because they just want, they want a, a streamlined process. So if they have, you know, a thousand stores that are unionized or 2000 stores that are unionized, it's, it's easier for them in the long run just to have all the stores unionized because then they just know we don't have to do, we don't have to think about this. We know we can negotiate one time we're done and we have it and everybody's unionized there. And this is the, this could be the biggest sort of like, like you say, uh, service industry unionization um, that has happened in, I, I, I mean, a long, long time uh, because we don't have fast food uh, unions. We don't have, and this is becoming increasingly a, a really important sector. And uh, this is, I mean, it's an amazing story because it really does feel like, you know, again, uh, you got to get an agreement on paper and you don't know what that's going to look like, but they have made the big decision. It seems like, you know, wh there's no reason why they would have been, th this would be a really weird way to fake you out in some yes, way. Uh, uh, and I don't, I, I always said, I thought I would knew and I'd know in my gut when, you know, when we'd reached this point and I, it feels like we've, we've reached this point, which is, Amazing. What I think is also huge and should be noted is the company has also agreed to let the workers in these stores negotiate these contracts. You know, the table will have workers. This isn't like, you know, a lot of these backroom deals that you hear about where, you know, president of the union and, you know, president of the company come together and they hash this out and then they come out and they're like, we've, we've come to all of these these solutions and these agreements, and now we're going to have the workers ratify this contract. That's not what's happening. You know, this is step one in what's going to be a major victory. You know, we've we've gotten to the point of the company saying we want to work with you. Let's get an agreement, and now we get the workers across the table, which is all we've asked for for the last two and a half years, um, to negotiate their own contracts for their own stores, and that is that's huge. I don't know that I've ever heard of anything happening like that. Every one of these locations is going to have elected an elected bargaining representative. So you've got, you know, 400 stores, you've got 400 bargaining representatives. That's great. Um, it's massive. And, and, uh, so you said, okay, they're going to calculate back pay, right. Uh, that you lost under, um, the, uh, under the tipping, uh, you know, constraints that they had imposed upon the union stores. Um, is there a timeline? Like I assume, obviously they haven't paid you yet because th th they just announced this yesterday, but is there a timeline? Are there, are there ways in which you can say like, oh, okay, um, this date is passed, red flag goes up type of situation. Um, I don't know that we've reached what we've, what they've told us and what we've asked for is as soon as possible. There are things that can happen faster than other elements, you know, like getting the credit card tipping into the stores can happen a little bit faster than calculating what the back pay is for, because that's, you know, I have a different pay rate than probably every one of my coworkers in my store. We all have different pay rates. We've all been with the company for a different period of time. You know, I started at the beginning of this campaign, someone might've come into the store a year into it. So there's just a lot of different variables for how to calculate that they have to do that. That's, that's on them. And we have to sort of check their results to make sure that things are, you know, done correctly. I don't have any reason to believe that they're not going to do this as quickly as possible because they publicly stated they were going yeah, to do this. I mean, so that it, would just, be... it would be a move to not to do, not do that. What, uh, just, and, and lastly, like, what are like the, the, the sort of the cultural, implications of this i mean you know you, you have this relationship with starbucks where you're like you know you you you'd seen them as a long time employee make mistakes but then uh you know correct it like uh, are the 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 shareholders the board of directors i mean um is this is there a sense that like some of them really felt like this is not reflective of the company that we want to be and that uh you know uh, maybe there was a little bit of too much in loco parentis from, uh, Schultz. And, uh, and I, I wonder like on that level, is there, is this, uh, are, is there like a cultural aspect to this within the company? And I would also imagine like your customers, uh, because I, you know, I'm going to go back to Starbucks now. Uh, you know, I like it, uh, 
I mean, I don't go every day, but I mean, if I, <laughs> you know, like I'm not going to avoid it. Let's put it that way. Um, I think, I think what we're seeing with this new acceptance is a shift in the culture of the company, I hope, or at least um, a commitment to be who they've always said that they are. And maybe, maybe that's more what it is. I think what we saw with, with Schultz was this was his legacy. This was his child. As you said, he had built this, you know, the company's 50 plus years strong. And I think there was, you know, we were coming along and saying, Hey, sir, this is not as great as you think it is. And I think that hurts. I think that's hard to hear something like that. I think in relationship to the new CEO and the board of directors and the shareholders, they are able to maybe distance themselves a little bit from that and just look at it. I don't want to, I hope not purely from a business standpoint, but certainly from a business standpoint where they can say, look, this isn't, this isn't good for us right now, the way things are going. And we need, we need something to shift. You know, Starbucks has always referred to us as partners. That's their, their, their whole thing. Part of that is because we all have shares within the company, a very small amount. I think all Starbucks workers in the country own something like 2% total, but still that's why they call us that. But they've also used that term to imply that we have more of a say in our workplace and in our working conditions than we've ever actually had. And so this right now is the ability to put their money where their mouth is. You know, if we are the workers are negotiating our working conditions and everything that goes with that, then yes, we are partners. And I think they can say that in good faith without it being like a sort of like ha ha joke, uh, which is what it kind of has been for a very long time. Um, I hope that's what they want because that's certainly what we want. Well, uh, Michelle, congratulations. I mean, this is, uh, it really is amazing. You must, uh, I mean, I know I've, I've read a couple of articles where you've been quoted in there and uh, it sounds like you, you were like, uh, cry, cry, uh, you know, crying with joy. Um, and I can imagine excited. this has been uh, really uh, quite a journey for you. Um, let's, uh, we will check back within, uh, back in with you in, uh, in, in the coming months to see how this is going. But again, congratulations. You guys did a great job. This is, really like uh, what a what an important example and illustration uh for you know just uh workers across the country who you know saw what you guys did in that first um shop in buffalo and the implications that it's going to have for not just your you know your shop your company but across an entire massive sector of our economy. It really is uh, great. Congratulations to you. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to take a, a quick break. And uh, in a moment, we're going to be talking to Melissa Ajira Grant. She's staff writer at the New Republic. She is writing uh, about the um, Project 2025 uh, that you've probably heard of. Um, there's a lot to this. Uh, but we're specifically going to be talking about some of the more sort of like uh, um, uh, theocratic and uh, patriarchal uh, aspects that, and yes, we're talking about like what an administration is going to do, but this is, that's, that's their whole, that's their jam. Um, also breaking news. Mitch McConnell, the longest serving senate leader in history i did not realize that uh is going to step down from that position in november um it's unclear to me is he going to resign from the the senate or he's just gonna it seems right now just to be leadership just to okay. resign from the, the uh, leader of the senate of republican senate conference uh position there you go um so uh McCon and and I guess now let the Hunger Games begin, right? I mean, who becomes the? Um, it's going to be like Thune is like the is, the is number two, the, right? It's going to be the battle of the three Johns: Barrasso, John Barrasso of Wyoming, John Thune of South Dakota, and John Cornyn of Texas. And what happened to uh, what's his face from Florida? Scott. Yeah. Well, he maybe might try and do the stalking horse uh, anti McConnell faction uh, position, but we'll yep. see. All right. And uh, I understand um, when I said uh, breaking news, Mitch McConnell, a lot of people were like, um, <laughs> that, of, yeah. that he, Anti -climax. he had expired. <laughs> but uh, no, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, all right. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back uh, with Melissa Jerry Grant.
We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Emma Vigland out uh, for today. Uh, I want to welcome back to the program Melissa Gira Grant. She's a staff writer at the New Republic and uh, has written a piece, Conservatives Plan to Ban Abortion and Cut LGBT Rights Starting Next January. Uh, Melissa, welcome uh, back to the program. Um, this is, we're talking about Project 2025. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, not to mention a rival magazine, but uh, American Prospect had a day one agenda, um, like sort of like a long term piece that they had done. They had talked about for for Joe Biden, what he, it was in his authority to do, et cetera, et cetera. This is sort of like that, except by the entire Republican Party apparatus, as opposed to a magazine. <laughs> um, right. Walk us through. And so the the the. Uh, this is something that's going to happen if uh, Donald Trump gets elected. Uh, this is not a this is not an advocacy uh, document. This is literally a blueprint. Just w- first, let's start with like who wrote this and who are the players in it because this is like um, I don't know. It's like a, the supergroup, as it were, of conservatives. Yeah. And since I filed the piece, it's grown. So when I filed the piece, it was like close to 90 groups. Now we're up over 100 groups. Um, And to your point of this is going to happen, like this entire project, like think about it as what they wish they had in January 2017 when Trump entered office. This is supposed to be something you can deploy on day one so you have all the right staff in place to make everything that Trump wants to happen and the right wants to happen, happen. Um, there's no incompetence here. You know, the, the effort is led by the Heritage Foundation. They have done documents like this before, like going back to the Reagan years. This is a little bit different in that they're also recruiting personnel. So they're running like a portal online where people can apply to essentially join the next conservative administration, which of course will be Trump. They're not talking about it as if it will be Trump, but it will be Trump. Um, I can't imagine anyone else would run with this. They are a super group, yes. Um, Groups folks might be familiar with from this coalition behind Project 2025 would include Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, who overturned Roe versus Wade, who has another major case before the Supreme Court right now about the abortion pill Mifepristone, trying to roll back access to that. And as you go through the document, you can see that some of these things are actually also already in progress. So some of the arguments that Alliance Defending Freedom is making at the Supreme Court next month are mirrored in this document. So it, there's no secret plan here, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Like this is all out in the open. You can go and download this for yourself from Heritage Foundation's website. Um, some of it will be very familiar if you've been following the attacks on abortion rights and on queer and trans rights in particular. Um, and it's quite extreme. I don't know if you want to go down through some of the specific. I, I, I do, but I want to, okay. I want to just state because, uh, because there really is two elements to this. I think that this story One is how incredibly extreme it is, but the other is what you, what you've suggested about uh, what they would have wanted in 2017. I mean, people forget no one thought that Donald Trump was going to win. I don't Mm -hmm. think the Republicans thought that Donald Trump was going to win. The Democrats certainly didn't think that Donald Trump was going to win in the general election. Um, I didn't think that he was going to win in the general election. Mm Uh, people thought they're just, you know, he's going to happen and uh, they'll pass and then they'll, 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 they'll be the opposition party. So there was nobody who was uh, uh, doing a game plan. And mm-hmm. I think, uh, you know, back like if there were people doing a document like this with Mitt Romney, they wouldn't feel like they had full license to do what they wanted to do. But this is the sort of that combination of, we're getting ready to do to implement this stuff and we're going to have full license. I mean, Donald Trump grabbed the Heritage Foundation list of judges and just he did it like, uh, you know, in, in the way that uh, somebody would grab a grocery list and mm-hmm. take it. I mean, he got every one of those things there. So people have to understand this is not like you say about being a secret plan. This is about something that is so almost like fully corporatized but then so radical and extreme uh, on the other side. Heritage Foundation is like probably the, 
I don't know. Would you say like the sort of like primary um, uh, uh, think tank in in the conservative Republican movement? I I would say that yeah. And there are you know other groups that they work hand in hand with, like you mentioned, the judges. Um, you know, the Federalist Federal. Society and Leonard Leo are kind of common elements, you know, with them. Also, Leonard Leo is funding many of the top groups or his various dark money funds, I should say, are funding many of the top groups involved in Project 2025. So, like, as he a got totality, donated a billion dollars, right? I mean, didn't uh, Leonard Leo he, get he a got like the largest single donation anyone has got from any cause in United States history. And he has been parceling that out through various dark money groups, through PACs, where it's really hard to sort of figure out where it's coming from. But we do know where some of it's coming from, from that major gift. And we can track it through these various orgs. And it's just slush money all over Project 2025. Like, I don't know. They would be in a very different position if they didn't have access to those resources. So, all right, let's walk us through some of the um, the the lowlights uh that uh are in this because it really and you really are looking at this i mean uh like you say this is a um a 900 page document so you know somebody could go through this from with a lens of uh various uh you know regulations in certain industries and um approaches to to civil rights or to other things uh you really took a lens to this um of like sort of almost like the theocratic uh, sussing out the theocratic really um and I, I, I mean i think ultimately it comes from like a theocracy uh mm -hmm. but it it filters its way through sort of patriarchy and then sort of like some type of uh gender um the wars that they're uh waging but wa walk us through uh some of the uh, low lights here sure so the there's like four guiding principles in this document i started with number one which is a whole set of policies that are supposed to enshrine the family by which they mean a you know traditional one man married to one woman with their own biological children they are that specific so already they've abandoned same-sex marriage that's gone they're you know trying to roll that back that's beginning of the document we're going to say this is the only group that is the family and now everything that we're fighting for is about them purportedly what they want to do to sort of reinforce that family is like cutting all kinds of social programs, number one. You know, like I looked at health and human services and education, but somebody could do a, a version of this that looks at housing or looks at what they want to do with the Justice Department. What they're doing to the Department of Education, in addition to just saying it shouldn't exist, like that's one piece, um, but they're not going to get that, maybe. They go through and they talk about kind of this parental rights concept, which I think people may have come across in some of the various projects of, of these right wing groups. Um, and it's also, as you pointed out, it, this is the Christian nationalist project. So it's also about we as sort of the chosen people of God, we're ordained to rule in this way. And so when they talk about parental rights, they mean parental rights insofar as they align with them. There are no parental rights, for example, for the parents of trans kids, like Nex Benedict, right. who died as a result of what looks like an anti-trans attack in a public school. Um, a lot of the policies in place in that school are, you know, the ones on bathroom use that prevent trans students from using the correct bathroom, from playing on sports teams, and then also just this general sort of political climate that casts doubt on trans people generally. They want to take that and bring it to the entire country with this report. So, and, with this and, 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 and I want to get like, you know, fairly specific in terms of sure. their mechanisms, because um, when you say like, you know, right now, uh, let's just start with marriage equality and we'll work our way down because, you know, um, if you have a, uh, you know, Oklahoma ban on, uh, on, uh, on trans kids using uh, bathrooms that are associated with their, uh, their uh, gender identity, that's something that they would impose on a federal level and they would try and roll back some of these uh, um, uh, uh, civil rights uh, legislation or the way that they are prosecuted uh, in the same way during the Obama administration, the Obama administration sent out a letter and said, just a reminder, um, uh, trans kids can use the bathrooms that are associated with uh, their gender. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, the, the Trump administration could, could send out a letter like, Hey, 
don't worry. Uh, we've reinterpreted the way that this uh, legislation works, and you're you're fine uh, right. to to dictate. But uh, let's say like a marriage equality. Like, mm -hmm. how would they, since the Supreme Court, how would they try and roll this back? Would it be in a like? Do they have like a a list of of regulations or laws or subsidiary laws, like you know rules that would begin to strip the rights associated with marriage for people who are of the same sex? They're really coming for the 14th Amendment when it comes to things like same-sex marriage, but also a host of issues, whether we're talking about abortion, other kinds of reproductive health care, um, the issues that folks are facing in schools around gender identity and having the their access to bathrooms and sports limited based on you know their gender as assigned at birth. They see and you can see this in Clarence Thomas's um, concurrence in Dobbs, where he sort of like signposts what this theory is, that the 14th Amendment, um, as it has been interpreted to give us a right to privacy, right? And that's the engine of Obergefell and same-sex marriage. That's the engine of loving, right? Which got us an end to bans on interracial marriage. It got us to Griswold, which is what legalized birth control for everyone. Um, they're trying to chip away at that and essentially say that we don't have that privacy right when it comes to our sexuality, when it comes to our gender, when it comes to our families. So that's, they have to, they already have the judges in place also to give them that. So I think it's a very real fear. The other piece of it is that they're looking to some very archaic laws that we just have not taken off the books to advance this agenda. They want to instruct the president to instruct his Department of Justice to enforce these laws that have not been enforced for more than a century. The key one there is the Comstock Act, which was you know, originally conceived of as an anti-obscenity law. But if you think of what was obscene in 1873 when it was passed, it includes everything from you know, porn, yes, of course, sex toys, but contraception and the mailing of any instrument that could cause an abortion. So, they weren't thinking uh, about Mipa Pristone in 1873, right, right. but that's what these groups behind this Project 2025 plan are thinking about now. So they day one want the next President Trump to begin enforcement of the Comstock Act. Um, some of that legal theory is before the Supreme Court right now, um, but they're essentially saying, like, we don't need to wait for the courts. You know, if we get the right guy in office, he can just start forcing enforcement of this. And I mean, it would be chaos. It would be complete chaos. But I think part of what's going on here, too, is like instilling fear in people of, you know, the consequences like violating the Comstock Act can come with a prison term. It's not that they're going to be able to arrest everyone who mails Mifepristone, but they're going to create an environment where people are too scared to do it because now something is being enforced that wasn't before. This is analogous to saying um, you, you we're going to have a series of exceptions in which you can get an abortion, but we're going to make it uh, so that you can't really assess uh, whether you fall within that uh, exception. And so if you're a doctor and there's you're looking at the penalty of of prison uh, or, um, you know, a certain losing your license you begin to self, um, I don't want to say sen censor, but self uh, edit your behavior in this instance, because you're, you're afraid you don't know where the law is. You don't know whether you will be prosecuted. Um, and, and that's what's happening there with that. Um, what l take us to the, to the next step, um, uh, that, uh, of, of that, 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 that next sort of like pillar that you were talking about. Sure. I mean, they, in addition to you know wanting to break, erode the protections of the 14th Amendment, in addition to wanting to enforce archaic laws, they also want to get involved in further regulation and punishment um, that doesn't, for organizations and individuals who don't conform to this plan. What's a concrete example of that? They want to strip the words reproductive health, reproductive rights, abortion from all government documents. It's impossible to do, but what it does mean is if you are, say, a public health organization that gets U.S. funding, now there's this hammer hanging over you. Are you going to take the word abortion out of everything that you use government money to do? Um, 
there's like kind of two prongs here. Like one is like, let's erode protections and then let's like really heavily police people. And they're using systems that are supposed to like, PEPFAR, for example, it's an engine for HIV AIDS funding. It's an incredibly successful program, but they essentially want to say you can't actually do any PEPFAR programming if it mentions sexuality or sexual orientation or gender. Um, you can't do HIV AIDS education unless you emphasize abstinence. You, some of this is like things that might be familiar from the Bush years. Yep. But they're doing it in a different context where I think they have much more support within the Republican Party for doing things that maybe the Republican Party would have thought of as kind of marginal and not that important. But by connecting them to this like kind of vision, which frankly reminds me of, you know, the 14 words of the neo-Nazi party, you know, this is all about protecting these imaginary children, often presumed to be white children of the future. And with the specter of like protecting that child, they're able to do everything from expose kids to violence in schools to end HIV funding around the world if it doesn't comport with this worldview. Uh, and again, they're the the other aspect that they're doing is not only articulating these um, these principles, but they are going out and regardless of you know, I remember when they were doing this for the CPA in Iraq, mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily find the um, the most adept people but the it it seems like the quality of personnel you need to carry out this is much lower frankly than if you were to insert them and try and um you know rebuild a society that had been bombed out they're just going in there and half of all they need to do it seems to me or even three quarters is just to wreck stuff mm -hmm. It's a wrecking ball that they're handing them to in this document, right? Like, don't think about the justifications for what you're doing. You know, don't point to any specific policy. You just use what we've already given you. And now you go out and carry this out. And, you know, that could require everything from, you know, civil servants posts that are supposed to be apolitical. Like one of the things they wanna be able to do is to have many, many, many more political appointees carrying that out, that, that those functions, so that ensures that somebody could have more control over who is in those roles, who would be carrying out this plan. You know, they need everybody from the head of Department of Health and Human Services to the grants, grant admins, you know, within the State Department doing HIV funding. It's a top down approach, but they need people all up and down the chain who are on board ideologically. Um, and that will be the primary litmus test for who they put in place as well. You can see that from the kind of recruitment efforts that they're doing, asking people about, you know, essentially when they got red pilled without using that word, you know, show us your social media profiles. Are there only two genders? How do you feel about illegals? You know, it's, there's nothing policy based there at all. It's, it's purely far right vibes and do you right. there's no there's no criteria or qualifications outside yeah. of uh, there these, these are ideological purity tests all right lastly like you, you mentioned like there this is part of their recruiting do you have a sense of like where they are in their recruiting like how many how are they doing intake how many are there and you know and, and part of what you're saying about like all these questions and the social media profiles is so that the people listening to the show can't go and clog up their mechanism. They, they have now a machine to make sure that they're getting the, um, you know, uh, the, the, the people who, uh, I don't know, uh, by the, the, the entire, uh, you know, follow TP USA, I guess, right. uh, on road trips and, uh, you know, uh, they're the still going to have to buy the CPAC out, tickets. Sure. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're well, still how are they have doing to, like... it? How are they doing it? And do you have a sense of like, how far along are they? Like, do they, do, are they putting people into a pool? Are they saying like, what, what do they do with those people? How do they keep them on ice until like the fall? That I don't know, sort of like what holding pattern they're in. Um, I know that they were doing recruitment online with like a Google form, which yes, conceivably anybody could fill out that Google form with whatever they want and, and send it on over to the Heritage Foundation. They were doing some recruitment in Iowa in alignment with presidential campaigning. That seemed honestly to be more about being a presence, right? Like we're marketing this thing that we're doing. I don't necessarily think they thought there were like ripe recruits for them 
at the Iowa State Fair, but maybe I could be wrong. I mean, they are just sort of casting the widest possible net here. What I have heard in terms of numbers, and I don't know for certain, you know, they're not disclosing how well they're doing. Um, but it seems like their numbers are not what they wanted them to be, that they were looking, you know, upwards around like 50,000 people to pull this off and their recruitment has only gotten them several thousand. Mm -hmm. So, you know, on that level, it might be that there are just people who are way more content to post online about these things than actually sign up to go to Washington and carry yeah, them out. I guess it, it remains to be seen. I'm not too, too optimistic about that yet because you're nine months out from a job that you don't know if you're necessarily going to have. Um, and maybe it picks up steam as we get closer to the election. And then I also got to imagine like the, the demo that they, they have to sort of thread the needle. We need to find young people cause it's going to be young people, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. people in their twenties and their thirties who are going to be applying for these type of, for a lot of these jobs. And they also have to be lunatics who, uh, have like, uh, ideologies that were, you know, better suited for the 1500s uh than than today but um i would imagine that's a bit of their challenge i mean i'm thinking of like what cpac looked like over the weekend right and imagining like who attending cpac would be like in the bag for this kind of plan and it could be as likely like the 20 and 30 year old nazis who were being allowed in um some great reporting in the nation has shown you know they were kicking out progressive journalists, but allowing avowed neo-Nazis to come into CPAC. So if that's, you know, wherever that exists and whatever even is the mainstream of the Republican Party right now, I can imagine that they could find enough people to at least have seats filled. Right. But I also have to imagine that there is a behind the scenes effort going on at the much higher levels, right? Like of the kind of cabinet level positions. Um, if you look at the people who wrote various parts of Project 2025, you do have, you know, former DHS, former HHS, like Dan Severino um, wrote the health section. It's, there is some overlap with some Trump administration figures that they also are probably gonna try to get back on board. I would imagine. I imagine it goes both ways, too, where it's, uh, you know, they're seen as a, a way to get into the administration. Mm -hmm. uh, Melissa Gio Grant, we will um, uh, link to your piece in the New Republic um, uh, conservatives plan to ban abortion, cut LGBT rights starting next January. Really appreciate you coming on and uh, walking us through this. Great. Thanks. All right, folks, we're going to take a uh, break. Head into the uh, fun half of the uh, program, wherein we will take your phone calls. We will, um, yeah, ProPublica reported that industrialist Barry Sade contributed $1.6 billion to Leonard Leo last year. It's fun to realize, like, you know, we have a certain, there's certain billionaires that I get name recognition, either on the right or the left, Gate Soros, sort of on the lefty, Koch brothers and that stuff. But there are lots of them out there <laughs> spending money. There's a, a article by a new uh, national or NPR writer um, that I just, tech reporter, um, oh crap, where'd that tweet go? Um, looking into billionaire Mark Benahoff's vast Hawaiian holdings, says Benahoff demanded to know the headline, called NPR CEO, says he knew the exact area where she was staying and brought up personal details about her family. You have a job and I have a job, he told her. It's, it's nice that we allow billionaires to exist. Of course. Speaking of uh, billionaires existing, folks, the one way uh, to that the one of the ways that the uh, right is going to uh, try and. Um, uh, win this election, of course, is they're going to um, try and bring out some of their big entertainment guns. Uh, they are going to, in their words, try and get the Voight out, or get out the Voight. Um, and uh, we uh, we responded with our own t-shirts. Get out the Voight. <laughs> Left is best. Get out the Voight uh, t-shirts. Uh, you can wear these, and uh, I guarantee you... Um, 80%, no, 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 98% <laughs> of the people that you come across, excuse me, 99% of the people you're going to, are going to be like, what are you talking yeah, about? Rehearse the story, folks. And you're going to be able to tell them, <laughs> but then you're going to be wearing your shirt 
and uh, some fellow Majority Report viewer is going to see it, and they're going to freak out, and you're going to have a lifelong friend for, for your entire life. Um, this is a limited run for obvious reasons. Uh, but uh, you can get them right now. They're only 25 bucks? Is that serious? Are we just covering uh, costs on Well, that? honestly... <laughs> These are union uh, American-made T-shirts. They they made out of like paper, like like uh, like tissue. Can't be much of a margin there. Julie and I have to talk about like what what, what, we, what we're doing here. Maybe uh, it's we've made it too easy to get products up on the web page. We I have know. To be more deliberate about this stuff. <laughs> Twenty-five bucks. Are you kidding me? What's a nice? Uh, I mean. You can put anything on there for 25 bucks. I mean, they could just buy it's like it for a the standard shirt. t-shirt. Yeah. Blue, white, and black shirts. Majority Report logo. Left is best on the back. We're doing three color printing on two different sides and three different sides for 25 bucks. Buy your t-shirts, folks, because it only costs us a dollar each to sell it to you. That's what our net profit is minus one. <laughs> we might be taking a haircut on this. <laughs> No doubt. <laughs> Sale ends March 13th. Yeah, I bet. Um, there you go. Get out the, get out the void. Um, folks, also, uh, just a reminder, it's your support that makes the show possible. When you become a member of the Majority Report, you allow us to sell T-shirts at a loss. <laughs> Loss-leaning T-shirts. <laughs> Oh, okay. Angela from Alberta said that uh, if it makes me feel better, they are thirty-four forty-four in Canadian. It's almost thirty-five dollars in Canadian money. Feel a little bit better. Yeah, a little bit better. Uh, honestly, it is our members that uh, allow uh, the show to exist and to thrive and to grow and to deliver the content we do on any given day. Um, I don't know if there's any other show that's really doing what we do on a daily basis. Um, there were times where I thought that maybe there were shows there, but really on a daily basis, we're bringing you, uh, uh dissenting, uh, Israeli Knesset members, um, uh, doctors who have worked in, uh, in Gaza. Um, we're uh, talking about, um, uh, antitrust and, uh, regulating, uh, common carriers like airlines. This is all in just like the past four days. Yeah. And the MAGA fascism plan. The MAGA fascism plan. Um, the We brought back a union organizer who organized the first Starbucks in Buffalo, having spoken to them a year ago now, and now to be able to check back in on them when this... I, I really do think that this is <clears throat> historical. Like, um, uh, Michelle Eisen, they're, they're going to... Somebody's going to write a book about this and, 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 and write about it for years to come because if this happens like it appears it's going to happen, in five years from now, um, you're going to see that entire sector um, unionized, yeah. more or less. And, you're going to, and we're going to see for the first time in 50 years a bump up in union density in, of private in, in the, in the private workforce. And so much of that is coming from what happened at Starbucks. Um, it's, it's a really big deal. Um, so really selling that merch there, Sammy. Yes. Thank you. Uh, become a member, uh, join the majority report.com. Also, don't forget justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. No chocolate, no tea. I forgot. But there is hot, hot cocoa. I don't know why they dropped that stuff. Made my life a lot more difficult. Uh, Bradley, what's happening on ESVN? Yeah, on uh, Monday on ESVN, we had a fun little show for my birthday. Uh, we... Um... We did a little uh, fantasy draft of our favorite um, Super Bowls from the 21st century, and if you you would, would be surprised necessarily that um, 
Emma selected Super Bowl 42. I won't go into details on that as her favorite um, for Sam's sake. Um, we also discussed EA Sports sort of ripping off the uh, college football players with the, with the now uh, the game coming, their new uh, NCAA college football game coming on after a long, long hiatus due to not wanting to pay their players and uh, Doc Rivers having some issues uh, now that he's uh, assumed the mantle of the head coach of the Milwaukee Bucks. So youtube.com slash ESVN show for more to check out the streams or some more clips if you'd like. Matt! Uh, yeah, last night on Left Reckoning. Uh, last show before we take a little, like a, about a week uh, break, um, because David Grissom's getting married. Uh, and I'll wow. actually, uh, actually won't be here tomorrow or Friday. Um, so yeah, congratulations to David uh, and his partner. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll uh, I will, okay, so last Tuesday, though, um, Alex Hockley did a review of three books on uh, the sort of failures of the millennial left, Vincent Bevan's book. Um, a book by Chris Catrone and uh, I'm blank. Oh, uh, Anton Yeager's book, uh, and uh, we talked about that. So uh, check that out last night, and uh, yeah, we'll see you uh, in a little bit. So patreoncom just left reckoning if you want to give David Griscom a little wedding present. Um, you, I hope uh, you're gonna uh, live stream the wedding. I mean, this is a huge content um, uh, fail. Well, you're probably part if you guys aren't putting up clips, and there will probably. It depends how in the bag we get with alcohol, but we might try to record some honky tonk footage and stuff like that. We'll no, that'll be pretty funny. All right, six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. We will uh, take your phone calls and see you in the fun half. You right. are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy, back. And the alpha males are back. Back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 boy, back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman. And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a whoa! Oh, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. Bring back DJ yeah, or a couple of them. Just put them in rotation. DJ Dan. Well, the problem with those is they're like forty-five seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See, white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Uh, 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 oh. Snowflakes.